Well, thanks for taking a few moments with me on moments, right? And I'm excited about tonight's moments because I really have been hearing and feeling from God uh, uh, something really simple, and it's just the simplicity that is in Christ. I want to talk about the simplicity that is in Christ. And uh, I'm going to probably drill down on this another time even more in more detail and more depth, but I want to spend some time out of some scriptures in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and in Luke chapter 10. And really one of the things that God spoke to me during the pandemic that was so clear to me was to strip away the complicated and to see our lives so often, we're so it, they're so complicated. We, we, for some reason, we're addicted to complex and complicated things and we need to break that addiction and realize that it's okay to have simplicity in life that we don't need everything that we think we do and we don't need all of the the brain power in the world to go towards solving our problems we really can have a simple relationship with God and a simple relationship with ourselves and a simple relationship with people it can be full and 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 powerful and and it can be exciting and it can be rich but it doesn't have to be complicated and so because life wasn't meant god's god never meant for life to be so serious and so complicated he meant for it to be a a, a life of joy and a life of fruitfulness when god put adam and eve in the garden it was all to tend the garden and and to eat of its fruit and to live and enjoy life and enjoy their relationship with God and enjoy their relationship with each other. Of course, the serpent wrecked all that and Adam and Eve messed that all up. But the second Adam came, Jesus, uh, and fixed it and said, take my yoke. Come to me, all that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. and You'll find rest for your souls. My, he said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. The Christian life was never meant to be some heavy burden. You know, it was a very heavy burden for Jesus to take our sins upon himself. It was a heavy burden for Jesus to become sin on the cross. It was a heavy burden for Jesus to become the curse so that we could have the blessing, to become sin so that we could have his gift of righteousness, to become poor so that we could have his provision and blessing and abundance. And, you know, he has so many great plans for you. Remember, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you would have and enjoy life to the full till it overflows. So I love that that Jesus came that we would have life in abundance. He describes it as in abundance to the full till it overflows. And um, so I want to pray for you. And then I want to teach you God's word. I just sense um, a, a moment to pray and believe God for your healing, believe God for your blessing and just to pray a simple prayer for you. Okay, you ready? Let me let me just pray for you real quick. Father, thank you for every person who is hurting in some way. I thank you for your healing touch. I thank you for your delivering hand. I thank you for your blessing. Lord, deliver us from complicated lives and and revive in us the simplicity of our love relationship with you. Father, thank you that you said we could come to Jesus and his yoke would be easy and his burden would be light. We, we trade our heavy burden for your light one. We trade our, our yokes, our heavy yokes for your light yoke, to be yoked to you and to what you did on the cross. And we thank you for your healing power, your healing, your healing love, your healing hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Wherever you're hurting, whatever's hurting you, I pray it's gone. I pray it leaves. If it hasn't left yet, that it'll get in a hurry and skedaddle, okay? So um, 2 Corinthians 11, and, and I want to have one-on-one -on -one Bible study with you. We're together as a church family globally, but we're also one-on-one -on -one here in this moment, and I want you to feel that and, 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 and sense personal care for you from God, through me, from God, for you, um, 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul writes this. He said, I'm afraid lest by any means as the serpent beguiled or deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds 
will be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, I, it's very important to make this distinction because in the New American Standard Bible, which I, when I first got saved, is what I read the most of, and then I started reading from the New King James and the King James and Amplified and so many other translations, but in the New American Standard, it, 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 it actually throws you off a little bit because of the word that is used here. He says, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his trickery, your minds will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now, that word devotion is tricky here because it's not included in the original Greek language. And you can look this up yourself, but if you look in an lin- interlinear or Greek Bible, you can look up online and you'll see that the word devotion is never used in this verse. So it's Im- it's implied by the writers, or not the writers, but by the translators, they interpreted it as devotion to Christ. But that's that's so uh, that's a word that is vague. Like, what really is devotion? To Christ? How much devotion is devotion? How much devotion is not enough devotion? How much devotion is too much devotion? Right? It's it's very um, arbitrary and. It's not even a word that's used in the translation, and that's why it's so important to read it as it's really written so that we get the full meaning of it because it is a different meaning than devotion to Christ. It's not about our devotion to him. It's really our. De- it's really about his devotion to us. It's more his devotion to us than our devotion to him that the enemy wants to lead us astray from. The devil would love to get you to try to continue to try to devote more, devote more, devote more to God, but because that's a that's a an exercise in futility like at what point is it is can you ever truly feel like you're devoted enough but here's the beauty of this it's really more of god's devotion to us because it's literally translated as i fear lest somehow the serpent as the serpent deceived eve by his craftiness so your minds would be corrupted from the simplicity that is in christ he uses that terminology exactly, the simplicity that is in Christ. So being in Christ should produce simplicity in our lives. Being in Christ means if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature, it says in 2 Corinthians five seventeen. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away, all things have become new. You see, it's the simplicity of being in Christ. When you're in him, You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ, as it says in Romans chapter eight, when you're in him, you are made a king and a priest in Christ. You're seated with him in heavenly places. Being in him means that you have a place in Christ equal to Jesus, joint heirs with Jesus. We're joint heirs. As he is, so are we, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 verse 17, as he is in this world, so are we in this world as he is. Now, it doesn't mean that we're the savior of the world. Jesus is the only savior. Jesus is the only one that was ever without sin. But when we're in him, we're, we're no longer in sin. We're no longer in the devil's kingdom. When we're in him, we're in his family. We're in his will. We're in his inheritance. That's what it means to be in Christ that we don't work or struggle to get into Christ. We're, we're placed into him, into his, into his name, into his family, into his hands, into his presence, into his anointing. That's all done at the moment you're born again. And the battle that we're in is to renew our minds to that reality, to get our minds to line up with that simplicity of being in Christ. Now, simplicity Let's talk about that. So God spoke to me um, a few months ago when the pandemic, maybe a few months into the pandemic, and and I heard this. I heard this word, rev, you know, revival of simplicity. And man makes things complicated, but God makes them simple. God makes things simple, and then man finds a way to complicate it, make it harder. Like John three sixteen is simplicity when it comes to God's love and salvation it's 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 pure simplicity for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life that's simplicity like when somebody asks me 
is salvation really simple? Is it, yes, it's really simple. It's so simple that John 3.16 settles it. In order to interpret the Bible correctly, you have to, you have to interpret the Bible based on the, the most common denominator of all things. So when something looks like it's, maybe the Bible is saying we could lose our salvation or we could, we could forfeit it or we can give it back to God. There, there are some scriptures that could be misinterpreted that way, but if you interpret them correctly, the correct way to interpret the Bible is to find the, the most elementary common denominator. So if John 3.16 says, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, that is enough to have everlasting life. Another scripture doesn't add to that equation. Other scripture might point to some other aspect of our salvation, of our sanctification, of our the unfolding of our relationship with God and the unfolding of our journey because it's a blossoming. The kingdom of God is like a man that plants seed in the ground. It's simple. And then the seed grows and it evolves and it takes on the fruit of of what's inside the DNA of its seeds. The word of God is like seed and it has and it contains within the seed of scriptures and within the seed of God's promises is all the fruitfulness of joy and peace and kindness and love and the power of God and healing and deliverance and freedom and just so much. But just to keep it in its simplicity again when you when you look at a scripture the best way to interpret the Bible is to find the most the common denominator among all themes. So when, whenever there's a subject of salvation, the common denominator is grace. The common denominator is what Jesus did on the cross. The common denominator is to believe. So Ephesians 2.8, for by grace are we saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the free gift of God. Well, what is the free gift of God? The salvation is a free gift of God, the grace is a free gift of God, and the faith is a free gift from God. All of them are the free gift of God. He says, by grace are you saved through faith, not a result of works. Through grace are we saved through faith, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. There's no one that can boast except in Christ, that he did it all. He did it all. When you realize he did it all, that's what it means to be in Christ. He did it all and you receive it. It makes things simple. I'm not worried about losing my salvation. I'm not worried about God's gonna be mad at me tomorrow or God's gonna be mad at me if I'm not holy enough, if I don't do enough, if, I don't, if I'm not godly enough. God is patient. He was patient with us. Though it took time for some of us to get saved, it took till you were for me, it was like when I was around 17 years old. For you, it might have been when you were earlier, younger, or older. But God was patient that whole time. He was patient with us. And he's still patient. He's patient still because our relationship with God is unfolding. It's not stagnant. It's not in, it doesn't, God doesn't birth us as spiritual trees he births us as spiritual seeds, right? So it's the seed grows a little at a time. The, the, the born again experience is instantaneous, but then the unfolding of that is a process. And he says in Ephesians 2, 8, again, by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the free gift of God, not a result of, of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So if you put it all together, all of the working out things and the, what God works in, we work it out, all of that unfolding, all of that is after salvation. By grace are we saved through faith. It's the free gift of God, not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. But we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we're born again by what Jesus, by Jesus' work on the cross, his finished work on the cross. But we're, we're born again or created for good works. We're created to do good things. We're create, recreated, born again, to do good things for people and for God's glory. Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So he came to this earth 
doing good. We're born again. We are empowered by God to do good, to, to do good to others, to, to show love, to demonstrate kindness and goodness and the love of God. Now, again, we can, this can take us in so many different directions, but I want you to focus in on simplicity. Let's keep it simple. Let me give you a, a story from the Bible that is a well-known story because I want to I want to touch on this simplicity of our relationship with God, the simplicity of sitting at Jesus' feet and being with him and spending time with him, realizing that he never leaves us or forsakes us. We never lose God's presence. We never lose God's love for us. We never lose God's grace towards us. So we need to become more aware of his presence. And and that's what shifts our emotions. It shifts our, our, our level of peace to a whole nother level. And I want you to really enjoy peace in your soul. And so I, I take you to a place in scripture where two sisters are hosting Jesus, right? One was bothered and distracted and one was at peace, free from worry. One knew what was necessary and one had her priorities mixed up. One was offended and one was in love. One was distracted and one was devoted or simply receiving from Christ, receiving from Jesus. What made the difference? What made the difference? Let's go through that passage for a moment in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me? Okay, this is fundamentally the, the, the first mistake she's making is questioning whether God cares. Lord, do you not care? It's so, you know, um, you, I mean, you can feel this, right? This tension. Don't you care? It's, it's, a, it's a subtle dig and maybe not so subtle, but it's, it's like accusing Jesus of not caring. It, it, she's really not asking, don't you care? She's saying, you don't care. She's come to the conclusion that he doesn't care. Never come to the c- conclusion that he doesn't care because he does. The Bible says, cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. He cares. He cares. He cares about your situation right now. He cares about you and he cares for you. And he's cared for you your whole life. He got you to this point where where you're hearing his word and you're hearing about how much he loves you and you're hearing about how simple Christianity should be. She said, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? It's, it's so sarcastic and negative, right? And such a victim mindset. I've been left alone. You don't care. And my sister has left me alone to do all the serving alone. Then tell her to help me. She doesn't even, she doesn't even catch her breath to a- let him answer. She asks a rhetorical question that she thinks the answer is he doesn't care, but the answer really is he does But she's like, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone, question mark? Then tell her to help me. In other words, she didn't even pause to let him answer. He would have said, of course I care. Come sit down with her. Come sit next to her and let me share with you what I'm sharing with her. It's awesome. It's great. It's going to set you free, Martha. She didn't even let him answer. She's like, don't you care? Then tell her to help me. Don't you care? Then tell her. First of all, whenever you see somebody telling God what to do, you know something's messed up. <laughs> You've just broken. you just uh, like uh, broken the whole concept of simplicity, and you you just complicated your relationship with God to where you now have to tell Him what He should do, rather than just receive what He's already done and focus on what He's saying to you and what He's teaching you and what He's teaching us as a people. But the Lord answered her and said, Martha, Martha, my goodness, my Lord, you are so worried and bothered about so many things. But this is a real picture of how many of us are. We're, we're bothered and worried about so many things. But only one thing is necessary, Jesus said. 
See, this is what I love about Jesus. There's so much. I love everything about him, don't you? But this is one of the things that I really appreciate about him, that he keeps it simple. He said, you're so worried and bothered about so many things, but really only one thing is necessary. One translation says, there is only one thing that is needed, and Mary has chosen that thing, and he calls it the good thing, the good part. Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Okay, so there's so much, there's so much there. Okay, Mary was focused. She chose the good. She chose the good part. She chose the simple relationship. I want you to choose that today. Like by the end of our moments together, I want us to choose the good part. What is the good part? The good part is the part where we just listen, where we get to enjoy Jesus, where we get to sit at his feet. He's not telling Mary, now listen, here's my instruction to you. You need to change this and you need to change that and you need to change it. He's just talking to her about his love and she's experiencing his love and she's just listening at his feet, listening to his word at his feet. At his feet, she was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. So he's just sharing his word, teaching the word. He's teaching his love. He's teaching his goodness. And she chooses that I'm going to go ahead and choose to be a listener. I'm going to choose to sit and listen. And this is one of the things that we have a hard time with, sitting and listening, because we're so in a hurry to say, 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 and Jesus wants us, he's got so many great things he wants to tell us. We're afraid what he might tell us, but you don't have to be afraid of what he might tell you because he will never tell you something that is, that is um, contradictory to his character and his nature. He is love. His character is faithfulness. His character is he's faithful. He is love and he's faithful. He's, he's always saying something good. He's never gonna tell you something bad. He's never gonna tell you, what he doesn't like about you. He's never gonna, t- he, he, he's just gonna tell you what he said about you. He's gonna get you to believe what he believes about you. Anyway, I want you to see the difference between Mary and Martha, and I want us to make the simple choice, the choice for simplicity. I want us to choose the simplicity. Luke ten forty. it says, Mary was focused here. Mar- Martha was distracted, but Mary was listening to Jesus at his feet, and I want you to like see this picture. Mary is focused on Jesus' beauty. She's focused on listening to the pearls of love that and the wisdom that is coming from his heart because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what is God's heart for, for Mary? What is God's heart for Martha? What is God's heart for you? God, the Bible talks about God's heart is full of love. God's heart is full of kindness. God's heart is full of goodness. God's heart has no evil in it. There's nothing, that he has no bad intention. He's chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. So what comes out of his mouth is the overflow of what's in his heart. And what's in his heart for you? Love. What's in his heart for you? Devotion. What's in his heart for you? Faithfulness. What's in his heart for you? Absolute uh he, he has absolute adoration for you. He adores you. He loves you. He's crazy about you. He's wild about you. He's in love with you. That's what's in his heart. And so that's what's going to come out of his mouth. And that's why we, we can only interpret the scripture based on the character of God and based on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That is the only way to accurately and effectively interpret the scripture. Just like to interpret somebody's letter that wrote, if somebody wrote you a letter, they could say, two different people could say the same thing in a letter, but you could interpret it in two different ways based on what you know about the persons that are writing it. So if you got a letter from me as your pastor, it would be encouraging you and it would be blessing you and it would be inspiring you and it would be you know, telling you how, how we're in this thing together and we're... We're, we're a family, we're the family of God and come join me this Sunday and let's celebrate Jesus and celebrate one another. That's what you, you, 
you would come to expect. So if you got a letter from me that was that used some words, that, some language that didn't line up with that, you'd 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 say, no, I, I I don't think he means that because I know his heart. When you know God's heart, you end up knowing what he means when he says the things that he that he says, and every verse in the Bible should be interpreted through the lens of God's love, through the lens of God's faithfulness, through the lens of God's, God's complete finished work, Jesus' finished work of, on the cross, okay? That's how scripture should be interpreted. Anyway, the entire, I bet it back to Martha and Mary, their, their entire emotional condition was based on one thing, both of them had two emotional conditions. One was at peace and at rest and happy and thankful, sitting at his feet, and one was worried and bothered about so many things. Yet the same Jesus was in their house. They lived in the same house. They were, they were at the same event. They had the same Jesus. They didn't have a different Jesus, but they, they were focused on a different They were focused on something different. Martha was focused on what she had to do for Jesus. Mary was focused on what he has done for her. Mary was focused on what Jesus had done for her. Martha was focused on what she had to do for God. Whenever you get focused on what you have to do for God, it adds stress. I gotta do this for God, I gotta do that for God. But when you focus on what he's done for you, it brings rest, it brings peace, it brings calm. Their entire emotional condition was based on one thing, what they were focused on and what they thought about Jesus. Mary thought Jesus was great and he had forgiven her. Martha thought Jesus didn't care. So when she has that thought that he doesn't care, see, we were created to know God. We were created to know God's character. We were created to know God's nature. And I want you to realize this, that when you start believing lies about God, like he doesn't care, you you, you can't have peace when when you have disturbing beliefs, wrong beliefs about God. You can't be at peace. You can only be at peace when you have the right view of God. And what is the right view? He is love. What is the right view? He is faithful. What is the right view? He, he adores you. What is the right view? He searched for you. He sought for you. He went after you. He came for you. He died for you. He rose for you. He lives for you. He ever liveth to make intercession for you. He's given you the kingdom and he made you, he loved you, he washed you, he made you a king and a priest. Like this is what God has done for us. This is what God has done for us, for you and for me. Like when we focus on what he's done for us, it may sound selfish, but it's really not. When you focus on what he's done for you, you have nothing but absolute joy. You have nothing but absolute peace. You have nothing but absolute gratitude and you end up serving other people and you end up being happy to give and happy to love and happy to serve others because you're so full of his love, his goodness, his kindness for you and towards you. Oh, if we could get a hold of this, that the entire emotional condition, the difference between Mary and Martha was not that one of them had had Jesus in their house and one of them didn't. It was that one had a wrong concept of Jesus while he was in their house and one had the right concept of Jesus while he was in their house and As a result, the one with the wrong concept of Jesus was worried and bothered. The one with the right concept of Jesus was at peace and in love. I want you to see this is how beautiful Jesus is, and he wants you to relate to him in that way. It's simplicity. What what is Mary doing? Listening to him, listening to his word, receiving, thinking about what he's done for her rather than focusing on what he what she had to do for him. I'm going to stop here for today's moments and I'm going to pray for you, but I want you to make a decision today to choose to focus on what God has done for you rather than to focus on what you have to do for him or what you have to do for others. Like if we would fill our heart with the truth of what he's done for us, it will bring us to gratitude and to happiness and to peace. And we'll end up wanting to take this message to others and take this love to others and spread this. This is the good news. This is the gospel. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Let me pray for you. Father, give every person peace. We choose, say this out loud, say, I choose 
the good part. I choose to focus on what Jesus has done for me and what he has to say to me. I'm not going to focus on what I don't have. I'm going to focus on what I do have. I'm going to focus on what he has already done and what he's already given to me. Say that. I'm going to focus. I choose to focus on what he's already done and what he's already given me. And if you've never, amen, it's that simple. And we're going to just spend more time, another time on this and continue to strip away the complicated and revive the simplicity of being in Christ and being his son or daughter and being a part of his family and being a part of one another's lives. If you're not saved, if you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, I want to pray for you. Would you just pray? If if you're not sure you're going to heaven when you die, would you just pray this out loud after me? Just say, Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ into my life as my Savior and Lord. I believe, say that out loud, I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. From this moment forward, I'm a child of God. That's so simple too, isn't it? If you just prayed that prayer, you just went from darkness to light, from bondage to freedom, from being without God to having God in your life, being without salvation, now you have the free gift of salvation. And now, what are the next steps? Go to that link in the comment section or go to the link on your screen and download my book absolutely free, The Power of a New Life, and it'll take you through the next steps of this great journey. And one of the next steps is come back and join me on Sunday, either online or in person. I love you guys. I'm grateful for you, and we'll see you on Sunday. Wow, what a wonderful word that was. Revelation all the way around. I hope you were blessed. I hope you grabbed onto that gold, those nuggets. Yeah, the unfolding of his word was, was just amazing. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, if you love this content from tonight, we have so much more content. We've got a podcast, we have a YouTube channel. We, you can catch our stuff on Facebook. Uh, there, there's all kinds of platforms, all kinds of ways to stay connected, to stay plugged in to the word. And of course, we're here every Sunday uh, online, but also in person for our 1030 service at Hoffman. Get out. Get, get off your computer your screen and come on in if you're local. We We'd love you. to see you and celebrate. Yeah. Have a great week. We love you.